from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, welcome to the National Book Festival. It's always one of my favorite um, times of the year. My name is Kevin Merida. I'm managing editor of the Washington Post. Um, and I am here to introduce Robin Gavon. Washington Post fashion critic Robin Gavon is an elegant, classy, refined, laughter-filled woman whom you really don't want to mess with. <laughs> Her work is refreshingly honest, if at times brutally blunt. One of her great strengths is her power of observation, the ability to see what others miss and turn the observed into beautiful sentences and meaningful paragraphs. Here's Robin noting how the Republican presidential candidates love to invoke Ronald Reagan, but don't have the style of Ronald Reagan. At the start of the first primetime debate of this election season, the 10 top polling candidates stood on stage awkwardly, uncomfortably for a group photo it was a historic moment in front of a record-setting TV audience, and all 10 looked as if they were posing for an advertisement for a buy one, get one free men's clothier. <laughs> Not one was dressed with discernible sharpness or elegance. Their suits fit, sort of. It was a low bar, barely cleared. None looked to be in a first-name relationship with an expert tailor. Everyone looked the same, middling and banal, and that's not reagan -esque at all. And here's Robin commenting on all of the public elevation of the Obama daughters to trendsetters and style icons. It does no one any good to declare a teenage girl a style icon. Fashion can serve a lot of roles. It can be a tool of, for communication, an emblem of power, a statement about sexuality. But before it is any of those things, it is a pleasure. Girls and boys should be able to use it as an expression of creativity, a way of sussing out how they see themselves without being declared an icon and invested with the burden of representing something bigger and more universal than themselves. In 2006, Robin won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, the first fashion writer to ever do so. For subjects that range from Dick Cheney to Condi Rice to Oprah to J.Lo. Today she is here to talk about her recently published fabulous book, The Battle of Versailles, The Night American Fashion Stumbled Into the Spotlight and Made History. It is about a landmark fashion show in 1973 with American and French designers at the Palace of Versailles, or as the Kirkus Review put it, the night Parisian haute couture faced off against the upstart American designers and the Americans blew them away. Robin has been blowing me away for a long, long time, and I'm proud to have her in our newsroom. She left the post for four years, and I call those my crying years. <laughs> but she returned in 2014, and she's back cooking with real grease, as they say. It's an honor to welcome her to the stage, my friend and colleague, and the best fashion writer in the country, Robin Gavon. Thank you so much. That was an awesome introduction, especially when it comes from your boss. <laughs> um, I am a little bit nervous, and um, so bear with me. Um, and I want this to be informal, but I thought I would start by just telling you a little bit about how I came to write about fashion. Um, because I think a lot of people assume that if you write about fashion, you grew up reading fashion magazines and obsessed with clothes and having a real sense of your own personal style. And I had none of those things. Uh, I grew up in that well-known fashion capital of Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> and I did not have a subscription to a fashion magazine ever in my entire life. And frankly, my mother could go out and buy clothes and bring them home to me, and I would happily wear them. My goal was basically just not to be naked. But I came to fashion because I loved journalism. And when people ask me what I do, I always say that I'm a journalist who covers the fashion industry. I'm part of journalism, I'm not part of fashion, 
but I am lucky enough that I get to sort of stand in the doorway of the fashion industry and sometimes enter the room and then report back to um, my readers. And one of the, the things that I love about fashion is that, and particularly writing about it for the Washington Post, is that I don't have to terribly concern myself with trends. And that's a really good thing because I have said more than once that I would have to go to a fashion show and every single garment would have to be purple before I would walk out and go, oh, purple is a trend this season. I'm really bad at that. But what I do love is being able to look at fashion and try to understand how it fits into our wider culture. And as, you know, as I said once, when I look at a show, when I look at a runway show and I see some very strange garment coming, coming along like a rubber turtleneck, which I am not making up, I also have to remember that that turtleneck did not just appear five minutes ago. It went through an entire process from the idea that the designer had to a conversation with the designer's team, to a manufacturer, to a sample, to trying it on, to a, trying it on a model, to thinking about what it might be paired with, to putting it on the runway. So clearly, there is commitment to the rubber turtleneck. My job is to figure out why and try to explain that to readers. So that's sort of an explanation of why I was particularly interested in this topic. And in 1973 and in the years preceding that, the American fashion industry and the European fashion industries were very different. The American fashion industry essentially was made up of garmentos. They were mass manufacturers who had designers in, you know, in the back room, and they were working to pull together copies of what the French designers were doing. And I know that in today's market, it seems sort of odd to talk about copying because people get their back up about that. But back then, copying was considered just the way things worked, and it was very organized. So a store like Bergdorf Goodman, for instance, would send its team to Paris, and that team would pay what was called a caution, which was like a security deposit. That security deposit allowed the team to go into a couture salon to look at the collection, to buy the pattern, to buy the fabric, to come back to the States, and to duplicate it. And everything trickled down from there. So even if you were not a Bergdorf customer, if you were an Orbach customer, which was a sort of mid-priced department store in Paris, you took your marching, or in New York, you took your marching orders from Paris. But slowly, very slowly, a few American designers were coming out of the woodwork. They were coming out of the back room and they were trying to make their voices heard. But more importantly, they were trying to build businesses that were based on American creativity, an American woman's lifestyle, and also a contemporary lifestyle. And it was hard going. But there was one woman, and I love that it was a woman who was gonna break the glass ceiling, and her name was Eleanor Lambert. And Eleanor was a Midwestern woman who had come to New York uh, in the years before the Depression, with not much money, but a big dream, to have a glamorous life, and she loved fashion. But there wasn't much of a fashion industry then, so she turned her attention to the world of art. But she always kept in the back of her mind this desire to help people understand that fashion should be looked upon in the same ways as art, in the same way as film as part of our culture, as reflective of our, of our culture, and as important. She bided her time until the 1970s, when she happened to be chatting up the curator of Versailles, who she knew because of her art world dabbling. And he was looking to raise money to, to, to fix up the palace, which at that point had a leaky roof, and it had termites, and it had rodents and other gross and sad things. And good old Eleanor said, well, the only thing I can really think of to do is to put on a show. And 
That was her moment. And her idea was to have five American designers be invited to Versailles to present their collections alongside five French designers. The five French designers you may have heard of. They were Hubert de Givenchy, Yves Saint Laurent, Emmanuel Ungerau, Pierre Cardin, and for the house of Christian Dior, Marc Bohan. They were a big deal. The Americans were a motley crew. There was Bill Blass and Oscar de la Renta who were the old guard, as much as there was really an old guard. They had come out of the manufacturing world, they had learned their trade in Paris, uh, certainly Oscar had. Bill Blass always felt a little bit like insecure because he hadn't had a chance to work in a couture house in Paris, but he had spent a lot of time copying Christian Dior. And then there was Halston, who was the first celebrity designer, thanks to his connections with people like um, Liza Minnelli, Angelica Houston, Elizabeth Taylor, and so on. He also had just sold his business to Norton Simon. So he was a recently made millionaire. And he was also a recently made diva. He tended to refer to himself in the third person, which everyone loves when people refer to themselves in the third person. And there was also Anne Klein. She was the only woman. And Anne was particularly interesting because of all the designers, she pretty much had the biggest business. She was a very smart, savvy businesswoman. She wasn't making fancy, fantastical clothes. She was making real clothes for women who were going out, not into the workplace, but out to make careers. She was there for a new class of professional women. And she really represented the future of how women would think of themselves in the on the public stage. And of course, no one wanted Anne to be in the show. The, ma the male designers gave her such a hard time, both the French and her American contemporaries. They thought her clothes were boring. They thought that she would be just a nudge. They didn't want her there. But Eleanor Lambert really believed in her. She'd known her for a long time. And I think that it was important to Eleanor to have a woman representing fashion for America on the world stage. And then the fifth American designer was Stephen Burroughs, who was the youngest of the lot. He had not gone through the fashion system. He had found his way on the streets. He graduated from FIT. And with a friend, he started his own, his own shop downtown. It became a hipster hangout before there were really hipsters hanging out. And he attracted a wide range of artists and musicians. And he was cooler than cool. And he brought that most important thing. He brought buzz. And that was the, that was the, that was the team. That was the American team. And that was the French team. And I think. The, the context is important to know, because this was 1973. In 1973, Roe v. Wade had just been decided, or at least announced. Women were going into the workforce in droves. Hillary Clinton had just graduated from law school. The Kerner Report, which looked at the causes and the effects of the riots of the late 60s, had recently been published, and people were grappling with that. So there was a lot of upheaval culturally, and fashion had become this place of solace. Uh, a lot of the clothes from the 1970s were all about fun and dancing and body consciousness, and they were colorful and sleek and sexy. And in many ways, they were sort of in direct contrast to, to the kind of rough-edged upheaval of, of the culture. But th one of the things that really stood out in my mind as I was researching the book was the way that Eleanor and the designers and the people who were involved with the show really looked at fashion, not just as a presentation of clothes, but as this point of change or possible change in the culture. They thought that fashion had the capacity to make us think about people in a different way. 
And I wanted to read this, this one section, which I absolutely obsessed about when I came across the story, because I found it so striking. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the way, the depth of importance that people were placing on fashion. And again, remember this is just after the Kerner Report. The world of fashion was looked to as a place where the culture could find signs of racial progress. Expressions of beauty and glamour mattered. Good race relations required taking note of who was selling women lipstick and miniskirts, which meant that advertisers and designers began looking for black models. A current of earnest, idealistic do-goodism had been stirred. People believed, they hoped, that with a positive attitude and the right words and the right government programs, the anger could be quelled and injustice eradicated. So while Lambert equated fashion with patriotism in order to bolster the economy, New York's Bergdorf Goodman used it to make a pitch for racial harmony. In 1969, Bergdorf Goodman, the favored haunt of the elite, turned its spotlight on half a dozen black designers. More than 500 broad-minded New Yorkers paid at least $15 each to attend the show, which was dubbed Basic Black at Bergdorf's. It paid tribute to Arthur McGee, John Higgins, Mabel Lewis, John Weston, Louretha Williams, and a young rising designer named Stephen Burroughs, who had just started his professional career. The Bergdorf party was rip-roaringly popular. Both, black, both the black community and white society clamored to go. Governor Nelson Rockefeller, a moderate Republican and art supporter, purchased a block of tickets. Guests included singer Dinah Shore, an actor, Raymond St. Jock, and the clothes were youthful and charming. White crochet mini dresses with geometric details at the waist, plaid pajama pants worn with a midriff bearing top. The show benefited Harlem's Northside Child Center for Child Development, and it was founded by Dr. Mamie Clark and her husband, Kenneth Clark. In the 1940s, the Clarks became famous for their doll test, which revealed children's alarmingly biased attitudes about race. The Jotham Callens Quintet, a jazz ensemble whose members were costumed in dashikis, entertained the audience. Guests nibbled on cornbread, fried chicken, collard greens, and chitlins. I love that so much. I just do. In 1969, soul food was pure radical chic, and serving it at a celebration of black designers did not seem to strike any of the organizers as painfully condescending or vaguely horrifying. <laughs> but even then, passing chitlins around the fifth floor of Bergdorf went several steps beyond authentic. Guests arrived convinced they would see an electric evening before anything had even happened. The store hadn't seen this kind of excitement since it had hosted the Duke and Duchess of Windsor two years earlier. I guess people were interested because they want to endorse something constructive in black-white relations, which everyone is very concerned about right now, said Lorna Goodman, who was the daughter-in-law of the store's president. Her husband, Eddie Goodman, was third generation New York, and he'd recently left the family fold to focus on business development in the predominantly black neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Eddie assured the press that his new role had not been the impetus for the Uptown show. Rather, thanks to the nightly news, the deafening social chatter, and the mood of the country, his father's consciousness of what's going on in the world just sort of expanded. Eddie was not exaggerating. Race, as part of the cultural dialogue, had become inescapable. It was practically all anyone could talk about. Raised voices, ringing hands, and caustic words were signs of passion, honesty, and commitment. Back then, people believed verbal sparring could be meaningful and productive. The 60s had ushered in crunchy granola liberalism and navel-gazing self-criticism, bold political activism, and racial diplomacy. This was, after all, the era that spawned Tom Wolfe's radical chic and mau-mauing the flat catchers 
which assessed liberal guilt and black anger. It would not have been surprising had white guests arrived at Bergdorf wearing Black Panther berets and Aunt Jemima head wraps, proclaiming them all the rage. By the time soul food was being served on the fifth floor of Bergdorf, the race problem was part of dinner table chatter, church pew politicking, college campus protests, and the popular culture. There were no easy or obvious answers to solving it. But what made basic black even possible was the fact that people were actively looking for them. And as unlikely as it seems today, they were looking everywhere, from the legislature to television, literature, and even fashion. One of the outcomes of that emphasis and that interest in racial understanding and what fashion could conceivably do to further the conversation was that when the Americans had to make a decision about the kinds of models, which models they would take to uh, Versailles, they had 36, which they all agreed upon, and they chose 10 of the 36 were black models. Some of that was coincidence. They chose their favorite models. They chose models who they thought would be able to sell the clothes, who'd be able to bring a kind of emotion and individuality and movement to the runway. And many of those black models had learned their, um, had learned their occupation from spending time in Ebony Fashion Fair, which was not so much about just showing clothes, it was about entertaining. And the other reason that there were so many black models was because they came cheap. Uh, the models for this show received $300. A far cry from the I don't wake up for less than $10,000 days of modeling. But for $300, that meant that the models were paid, that included the models' pay for rehearsals in New York, it included their time in Paris, and it included their actual work on the runway. And understand that, you know, today a model does a show and she may walk out in one garment, and that's it. It's kind of amazing that they get as much money as they do to wear one look down a runway that takes all of approximately 10 seconds. The models back then were changing clothes rapidly. They would have four or five different looks in a single show, and oftentimes they had to do their own hair and makeup. So the models really were their own little self-contained companies. And for $300, the American designers really got themselves a deal. When they left to go to Paris, they were disorganized, they were fighting with each other, they could not agree on who was going first and who was going last because those were the prestigious positions. They could barely agree on how they would even produce the show. Typical of designers. But one of the most interesting bits of it was that Liza Minnelli was to be the star of the American show. She had just won the Oscar for Cabaret, and she was a very good friend of Halston. And Halston was being very sneaky about what exactly was going to happen. And he would never quite say what he was going to do. And this did not sit well with Oscar de la Renta. And so Oscar finally managed to get it out of Halston that he was planning to have Liza Minnelli come and walk in his portion of the show and Oscar was furious. So he called up his good friend, Raquel Welch. <laughs> and I wish I could do Oscar's fabulous accent and his whole persona, but he said, you know, Raquel, I need you to do me a favor. I have this big show and I need you to walk in the show and blah, blah, blah. And Raquel had been in Europe because she was promoting a movie. And then Liza got wind that Raquel might be on the runway. And Liza said, well, you know, Raquel's gonna walk out and she's going to be Raquel Welch, and no one's going to remember me, and Raquel's doing the show, then I'm not going to do the show, and hissy fits ensued. And at the end, the designers decided, okay, fine, Liza Minnelli will be the only celebrity, and she will be the person who essentially ties it all together. And of course, they went, they get to Europe, they fly over, 
The designers fly separately. The models are all on one Olympic Airways flight. I would like to point out that it was not a charter flight. But it was before the days of the TSA. It was when you could walk in the aisles, when you could smoke in the aisles, and they were smoking lots more than cigarettes. They were having, it was the 70s, my friends. It was a really good time. And just as an aside, as I was doing a lot of my research and had the pleasure of interviewing so many people who had been in their 20s and 30s in the 70s, I will say that a lot of the conversations went like this. So can you tell me a little bit about the time when you went to X, Y, and Z? I think it was 1972. Wow. Yeah. It, I had a great time. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember any of it. There's, there, were, there were a lot of faulty memories. Um, but one of the, the greatest things was that kind of enthusiasm and sort of uh, club culture and dance culture and freedom seeped into the clothes. And it seeped into Halston's clothes, it was in Oscar de la Renta's clothes, and most notably, it was in Stephen Burroughs' clothes. This was a guy who really, he ignored Paris. He took his inspiration from the dance clubs, from disco, from Fire Island, from his artist friends, and he was, we talk a lot today in fashion about sort of the disintegration of gender lines when it comes to clothes. Stephen Burroughs loved the idea that men and women could all pull their clothes from the same shared pile. He was gender bending long before anyone else was. And for him, it was not so much this sort of radical notion. It was just this idea that we should all be able to express ourselves in whatever way we chose. And he really underscored the notion that the body should be free. And his signature garments were constructed out of a kind of jersey, a very lightweight jersey. Not the kind of jersey that holds you in, but the kind of jersey that's often used for lingerie, the kind that gives you no help. <laughs> the kind that reveals a lot. But that was his point of view, and that also came out of the way the culture was changing. And when it came time for the designers to actually put their collections on the runway, you could see that. You could see the difference. The French collections were beautiful. They were showing couture. They were showing clothes that were impeccably made, that were formal and were elegant and were graceful and their models moved with precision. But one of the things that the Americans did was they brought these models with them who had learned how to perform. They had these clothes that had been inspired by dance clubs. They had clothes that were all about freedom. And one of the wonderful things that they were able to do was to bring the street onto the runway into the Palace of Versailles, and that was a marvel. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever seen models move that way. No one had seen them moving to contemporary music as opposed to classical music. No one had seen them revel so much, not in the clothes, but in the way that the clothes moved on their person. No one had seen that kind of individuality expressed through fashion before. And that was the thing that lifted the American designers up and allowed them to really succeed. And that success, I would argue, has also, also changed the way that we think about fashion. And while creativity flows from Paris still, the way that French designers, Italian designers, American designers, the way that they all work, I think is quintessentially American. American born of that 1973 show. Well, I would love to answer any of your questions about fashion, fashion and culture, whatever questions you might have. And I do hope you have questions. Don't make me come out there.
Thank you so much. you religiously. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just would like to mention something. A long time ago, I worked, uh, growing up in London, I worked for the House of Worth. Mm. And um, I came from a whole different background, so it was a revelation to me to be in that oak couture in a beautiful house that was down the street from the, Brit uh, the American Embassy. But I just, and, and the clothes were so exquisite. You I mean, you were just talking about the way they were constructed. Most of the clients were the wives of um, Greek ship owners because they're the ones who could afford, <laughs> you know. And I was sort of a house model. I was taller then, actually. I've kind of shrunk now. <laughs> and, um, but I'd just like to, um, if you'd like to talk about that. And I wonder what happened to the House of Worth. I mean, it probably sort of died out because once, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the mod look with Mary Quant came in, I mean, the whole different you know, London scene but I would just like to ask you about, you know, that whole. Yeah, the thank House you. of, thank you so much. The House of, of Worth, Charles Frederick Worth, um, that's, that's one of the, the secrets that the French like to keep, that it was actually uh, a British designer who created the world of couture as we know it today. Um, he was a, a savvy guy who um, started his business at a time when in France, fashion was really something that was set by the monarchy. You know, it was sort of court clothing. And whatever the royals wore, everyone else sort of tried to emulate. And um, Charles Frederick Worth decided that um, he was going to create fashion and present it, if you will, to the monarchy, instead of just being a dressmaker. And that was really how uh, couture, as we know it, started. And sadly enough, even though it seems like every fashion house that once existed is slowly being revived, for better or for worse, um, you know, the, the House of Worth hasn't had that kind of injection of new blood, the way that brands like v &A and Balenciaga and L'Envin, I mean, all these brands that existed before sort of died and then were reborn, um, some more successfully than the others. But it's a, a very storied house. Hi. Hey. I'm so glad you're back at the post. Um, I'm very glad to be back. <laughs> <laughs> When I read your, uh, what I, they feel like essays, your critiques, they, it, I actually feel like I'm reading either an anthropologist or a sociologist with a lens on fashion, sometimes more so, or it's a lens on culture through a focus on fashion, um, sometimes more so than some of the other critics who I also love. <laughs> um, but do you ever think of yourself in that way as a student of culture in general, anthropologist, sociologist? I, you know, I would never call myself an anthropologist or sociologist because those are very specific. Um, but I will say that I have always felt like I cover fashion the way that I do because I'm not n so much interested in the trends per se as I am interested in why they exist and this idea that even if you're, it doesn't matter if you're wearing a t-shirt from Club Monaco or you're wearing a $4,000 dress from Michael Kors, um, you've made a decision about how you want to be perceived publicly that day. And for some people, you know, fashion is about, or their style is about revealing who they are. And for them, it's a form of truth telling. And for other people, it's just the opposite. Um, it's, it's a facade, and it's a way that they can create a public identity. And particularly in places like Washington, beloved, my beloved Washington, um, and in Hollywood, I think, there are places where people are very attuned to their public identity. And you know, there's, they have so much in common. Hollywood and Washington, in the sense that people are acting on a stage. 
they're very different kinds of stages, but they're still performing on a stage and they're performing to an audience. And it's always fascinating to me to consider the kind of costuming that they choose. Um, you know, several years ago during a political, a presidential campaign, I was amused by just how often the candidates would go to a particular kind of event and they would all do the same thing. They would take off their jacket and they would roll up their sleeves. <laughs> and it was like this universal political gesture of, okay, now I'm gonna tell you the truth. Now I'm going to speak honestly to you. Now I'm gonna get like my blue collar on and I'm gonna talk you know, in really plain terms. And it was as if to say that you know, they can't do that when they're fully suited and tied up. Or there's something specifically about a suit and tie that would somehow imply that they're not speaking honestly. And I mean, it's a gesture that I think sometimes is automatic, but there's also, I think, a reason why the gesture exists. So that, I mean, I think that's why I write about fashion the way that I do. And also because I started covering it um, for the Detroit Free Press, again, that fashion capital. And uh, there was always a sense to me that, you know, I'm not preaching to the choir. I'm writing to people who are intelligent and who are interested in this curious industry, uh, but also have a sense of estrangement from it sometimes and need to sort of be welcomed in. And I think that's one of the, the best ways to welcome them by saying, you know what, it's not about these esoteric trends, it's really about your day to day getting dressed. Hi. Um, when you were talking about the discussion of race and kind of the contentious spirit of the 70s, all I could think of about, of course, was today and the discussions of race today, especially after Ferguson and Charleston. And I'm just wondering if you're, if you're seeing responses to that in the fashion world right now. Um, the fashion industry has struggled for a long time, continues to struggle with diversity. Um, I think it, it has certainly gotten better in the last few years. One of the things that um, has been I think pretty notable um, is what is coming from younger designers, perhaps because they feel like they have less to risk uh, business-wise. But uh, one young designer um, actually decided that uh, for the backdrop of his fashion show coming up, um, he wanted to create a video in which he talked to um, a wide variety of people on the subject of race, and he interviewed uh, the widow of Sean Bell, the mother of Oscar Grant, um, the daughter of Michael Brown. I mean, he interviewed people who've had direct um, dealings with some of the violence and the police aggression. And what I thought was particularly uh, refreshing is that he said no one ever asked him, well, what does this have to do with fashion? And I think that's a really good sign because for, certainly for the fashion industry, because it suggests that uh, more designers are becoming aware of their responsibility um, and they're becoming aware of the power that they have by being in a business that in many ways teaches us who we value and how much we value them, who, how we understand people, how we judge them, how we react to them, um, so many of our in interactions are short-lived and we make instantaneous judgments and often those judgments are based on appearance and fashion is the industry that dictates our understanding of appearance. So I think it's important and it's a good sign that they are stepping forward in some way. Could you say something about the plus size industry? The plus size industry is perhaps the most overlooked market in the fashion industry. Um, you know, it's, it's 
never ceases to amaze me when designer collections end at size 12. And it also amazes me when sometimes those size 12s fit like size 8s. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, in, for some designers, it is something that is changing, but for the vast majority of them, it is not. And it is a choice that is driven by fashion's perception of itself as a place of fantasy, uh, a place of exclusivity, and that has, for many brands, outweighed the logic for trying to reach as broad an audience as possible. And I think it's done some damage in terms of financial success of businesses. So I can in no way, shape, or form defend the fashion industry on that topic. I think they're missing the boat. And what frustrates me is when you do have brands that will launch a plus size collection, it's sort of ghettoized as this plus size collection and there's no dialogue between the broader fashion industry and this plus size world so that there are different, different trends are over there, different color palettes and it seems like they're not communicating. So if anybody has an investor who wants to start a plus size line, go for it. <laughs> uh, thanks so yes. much. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a word about uh, how U.S. and French fashion communicate with each other today. Uh, I know a few years ago a new, uh, there was a new startup line called Mayette, started by a South African human rights lawyer in New York, mm -hmm. who decided that all their shows had to be in Paris, then, which sounds so retrogressive, but why is that? And, and maybe you could talk about how that relationship continues today. Or, or is in discontinuity? Um, I can answer my last question briefly. Um, and yeah, the connection between uh, the French industry and the American industry, um, I think, is one of mutual respect. Um, certainly, French houses have a respect for American popular culture and the influence that it has on design aesthetics. And there's a great respect for American marketing and American salesmanship, which is why no small number of French houses have hired American designers to come and design collections for them. And it's also why a French brand like Givenchy decided to present its collection in New York. Um, they owe a great debt to American popular culture. Um, on the other hand, I do think that Paris remains the global capital of fashion. And it does so in part because of its history and tradition, but also because it is truly an international place for presenting fashion. You know, in, in the New York, it's mostly American with the occasional visitor. In Paris, the schedule is regularly filled with designers who are American, who are Japanese, who are British, who are French, who are Italian. It's where if you are a brand that wants to make an international statement in front of an audience with the largest bullhorn and the loudest microphone, Paris is where you want to go. And with that, I think I have to wrap it up. I'm so sorry. She's holding a sign. <laughs> Thank you so, so very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.